Welcome everybody to this special Zoom event in Barry College's Creative Writing Reading Series, a poetry reading by Paisley Rechtdahl. For those Barry College students here for cultural events credit, we will post a link in the chat during the Q&A following the reading, which will take you to a short survey to complete within 24 hours. Also, in lieu of assigning, we have a wide range of Professor Rechtdahl's books on display and for sale at the Shipyard, Barry College's bookstore. Tonight's reading, or today's reading, is sponsored by the Georgia Poetry Circuit, a consortium of 10 colleges and universities across the state, which has been housed at Barry College since 2007. It is with my deepest gratitude and great pleasure that I introduce to you now one of my favorite writers. The winner of numerous prestigious awards, Professor Rechtdahl has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Amy Lowell Poetry Traveling Fellowship, a Fulbright Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, two Pushcart Prizes, the AWP Creative Nonfiction Prize, and more. Her poems and essays have appeared in such venues as the New York Times Magazine, American Poetry Review, The Kenyan Review, Poetry, The New Republic, five volumes of the annual Best American Poetry Series, and on National Public Radio. She was also the guest editor for Best American Poetry 2020. Poet Laureate of Utah, she is a distinguished professor at the University of Utah, where she is also the creator and editor of West, a translation, as well as the community web projects, Mapping Literary Utah and Mapping Salt Lake City. Paisley Rechtdahl is the author of a book of essays, The Night My Mother Met Bruce Lee, the hybrid photo text memoir, Intimate, a book length essay, The Broken Country on Trauma, a Crime and the Continuing Legacy of Vietnam, and a critical work, Appropriate, a Provocation, an Examination of Cultural Appropriation, published by W.W. W. Norton in 2021. She has also published six books of poetry, including Animal Eye, winner of the Rilke Prize, and her most recent collection, Nightingale. Nightingale which rewrites many of the myths retold in Ovid's classic eighth century work, The Metamorphoses, begins with one of the most gorgeous poems in recent American poetry, Psalm, and is centered by one of the most powerful, Nightingale, a gloss. Like Ovid's Metamorphoses, Nightingale's poems are concerned with transformation, which can be freeing or imprisoning as the body and being are reshaped by violence, by disease, by devastating accident, or by need and choice, as in her poem, Tiresias. In Ovid's work, the seer Tiresias is magically transformed from a man into a woman for seven years, then back to a man, and was known to have special knowledge for having lived as both genders. In Rechdahl's poem, the transformation is doubled. The mother, transformed by cancer, recognizes the boy within her child's girl body, knows they would need a different body. And so she saved up for the surgeries to align body to the mind and spirit within. The long prose poem at the center of the collection, Nightingale, a gloss, weaves the poet speaker's own experience of sexual violence with that of Philomela. In Ovid's retelling of the Greek myth, after Tereus rapes his sister-in-law Philomela, she and her sister get revenge by killing his son and serving him to Tereus for dinner. The girls escape his wrath by turning into birds, Philomela into the nightingale. Rechtdahl's poem weaves the two stories together, personal and mythic, in a moving meditation on violence, art, and language. 
which, she writes, is the first sight of loss and our first defense against it, which is why after Philomela's brother-in-law, Terius, rapes her, he cuts out her tongue and tosses it, the bloody stump writhing at her feet. In considering the nightingale, long associated with the art of poetry, Rechtal writes, Keats returned often to the figure of the nightingale, a symbol common to the romantic poets. She quotes Shelley who wrote, a poet is a nightingale who sits in darkness and sings to cheer its own solitude with sweet sounds. Rechtal's poet speaker, however, grapples with the disturbing complexity at the heart of the poet nightingale metaphor. I have spent my life, she writes, devoted to an art whose foundational symbol is one of unspeakable violence. The poems of Nightingale pursue such difficult questions as they deeply examine the trauma of violence and memory, but they do so without denying the gorgeous presences of our mutable world, such as the urban peach tree on a vacant lot with which the book begins. The tree traffics, Rechtal writes, in a singular astonishment, its gold tongues lolling out a song so rich and sweet, the notes are left to rot on the pavement. If the song is beautiful, Rechtal elsewhere writes, you will listen. It is our great privilege now to have the opportunity to do so. Please welcome Paisley Rechtal. Thank you so much, Sandra. That was that was a beautiful and very moving introduction. And I know we've been writing and we've been conversing digitally about some of the same same issues. So it's great to be in conversation with you visually now a little bit too, not just intellectually. So thank you all for coming. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm delighted to be here <laughs> on my couch as well as with you. I'm going to share my screen because what I'm going to be doing is playing for you a poem uh, that you're going to sort of tell me what you would like me to read. This is from um, West, a translation. I'm Utah's poet laureate, and I was asked to write a poem about the Transcontinental Railroad for its 150th anniversary of its completion. It took uh, that completion takes place took place in Utah, basically 100 miles from my house. And so I devoted myself to reading quite a lot of sources. These are just a few of them um, for this poem. And I was trying to figure out how to encapsulate uh, the cultural impact that the transcontinental had on American life and society. And I also, being half Chinese, wanted to think about, in particular, the lives of the workers that we did not hear from and we do not hear from. Most of the studies that we have of the transcontinental focus on the people who own the railroad, the people who left a lot of uh, what we would call a material record. The Chinese workers, rather like many of the Irish American workers and black workers on the railroad and certainly the Native American workers, left no material record. We have not yet found any diaries or letters, um, no written record of any Chinese worker who has been on the transcontinental. So I found myself trying to figure out formally how to frame all of this material I was researching, but also to give it a particular Chinese framework. And I was thinking that using a, a poem carved into Angel Island Immigration Station might be a good one. I'll read you a note later on that explains something more about this poem. But first I'm gonna show you sort of how to enter the poem and how to sort of play with it. I won't, every, all of the videos are closed captioned, but I won't play the closed captioning for this one simply because um, it won't make any sense. Um, the other thing is that the image that you're looking at is the famous image by A.J. Russell 
the photo photographer, the official photographer for the Union Pacific. He was also um, the official photographer for the North during the Civil War. We can talk about that later on. But I wanted to juxtapose this image with the voices that you hear. These are the voices that represent the languages of all the people who worked on the railroad or continue to work on the railroad. And then it goes into the Chinese poem that would be the frame text. Δεν είμαστε επιβάτε στο τρένο. Lastly, so that Chinese poem opens into this website and every single character, pair of characters opens up into a story about the railroad or a documentary tech, uh, poem that you can read. So I'm just gonna read quickly a note about this translation. Uh, this website is being turned into a book. Copper Canyon is publishing it next year. And it is a book that divides in half. One half are the poems that you're gonna be experiencing here, but another half are these tiny short lyric essays that I've created as a series of notes that attach each to the poems. You can read all the lyric notes together as one long essay, and then you can also read the poems across the page to read to the note. And this is the note for the poem itself. This poem was carved at the walls of the Angel Island Immigration Station by an anonymous writer. Angel Island served as the California detention center for Chinese immigrating to the United States from Southern China. Detainees were held for days and weeks, sometimes up to 22 months. Some facing deportation committed suicide. This poem, an elegy written to one such detainee is written in regulated verse, eight lines of poetry composed of eight characters each. The closest corollary in English is the sonnet. The Chinese scholar and translator, Dr. Fu Sheng Wu, told me that in regulated verse, poems are assumed to be autobiographical expression. Here, however, the poet imagines what another has experienced. It's a very unusual elegy, Dr. Wu says. This imagination of the other is a violation of the form. My translation, too, is a violation. The Angel Island poem is part of a pair written to and about the same suicide though I have not include, included the second poem. The original pair was carved into the center's wall so that they could face each other, a mirror in the wood of Angel Island, reflecting between them the absence of the suicide. There is a mirror in the history of Angel Island as well. The Chinese Exclusion Act passed in 1882, 13 years after the first transcontinental was completed. The Chinese, considered racially inferior but cheap labor, were eagerly recruited to work on the railroad it is estimated the Chinese composed 90% of the Central Pacific Railroad's workforce. After the railroad was completed, however, politicians passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited all immigration of Chinese workers to the states. It's the first law passed to present, prevent all members of a specific ethnic or national group from entering the US. The act stayed in effect until 1943. The building of the transcontinental is thus a paired event just as the Angel Island poem is a paired poem. But though I gesture at both events, I have not included both poems. The reader may sense this exclusion. And yet, what is a translation except a carefully cultivated loss? Into this absence, I lean and angle my mirror. So I'm gonna to try to play um, with a larger screen, but sometimes Vimeo doesn't let me go back, so we'll see. 
Sorrowful news. Sorrowful news, sings the telegram. And Lincoln's body slides from DC to Springfield, his infant son, Willie, boxed beside him. Buffalo, Cleveland, Painesville, Ashtabula, two coffins, 1,700 miles, 14 days on 14 railroads. One day, a great line will unite us, the president promised. Father and son displayed capital after capital, Louisville, New Albany, Baltimore, Chicago. The black trains beach upon a tide of roses. Can you believe still in the promise of this union? I saw, General Dodge wrote, a little Negro drop on his knees and offer prayers. While above, the dark news thrums on wires, gone, 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 across poles tall as the ones from which the president ordered 38 Sioux to be hung. Yep, it's doing that again, drives me crazy. Ugh. Okay, it does work now. This is the note that accompanies that sorrowful news between April 21st and May 4th, 1865, the train carrying Lincoln's coffin traveled through 180 cities in seven states. Willie, who died in 1862 at age 11 from typhoid fever, was disinterred to travel with his father back to Illinois to be buried at the family plot. Death is an invitation to return. When I was commissioned to write this poem, my first impulse was elegy. My gungung and popo, my maternal grandparents, could trace their lineage from Gwangju, where the Chinese transcontinental workers immigrated from, though my own family has no relationship to the railroad. Popo was born in Ellensburg, Washington in 1910, immigrating to Hong Kong when my great-grandfather either fell ill or fled from being murdered by a rival Tong leader. She returned to America at age 18, where she met my gungung at an Alaskan cannery. Popo was American, gungung Chinese. Born in Nambin province, my gungung immigrated as a paper son to Chicago at age 15. A handsome man and womanizer, he married my homely Popo because of her English. When he died in 1985 from pancreatic cancer, Popo held an open casket funeral for him, though my mother refused to let me see the body. What do we seek from death's display? The day Lincoln's funeral train left on its tour, more than 10,000 people came to watch. The bodies of the Dakota Sioux that Lincoln ordered to be tried and convicted for crimes they likely did not personally commit hung for less than an hour before being dumped in a mass grave. Before morning, their corpses had been excavated by physicians or medical cadavers. Lincoln's funeral car, one of the most elaborately appointed trains built in the 19th century, was purchased by Twin City Rapid Transit President Thomas Lowry in 1905. Lowry planned to rehabilitate the car, restoring it to its former glory before he died in 1909. In 1911, prairie fires destroyed the car. Its metal couplings and window frames have yet to be discovered, the precious artifacts likely scavenged from the ashes. Okay, so now you're gonna tell me what you would like to hear, which you would, um, here are just some of the topics that you can uh, learn about adoption, African-American workers, the Civil War, biracial 19th century journalists, Chinese exclusion, Chinese death rituals, ho Hollywood, hobos, gender roles on trains, Irish Americans, labor unions, land art, Robert Smithson and the Spiral Jetty, manifest destiny, mass murder, Mormons, Native Americans, the Plains Indian War, prostitution, polygamy, photography, presidential impeachment, race relations on the trains, the telegraph, LGBTQ lives. Put what you would like to hear in the chat if you can, or I guess you can't shout them out, but you can suggest that to somebody else. Okay, here comes the chat. Um, let me see. LGBTQ lives, good choice. Adoption and Mormons, good choices. Everybody, Irish Americans, oh, excellent. These are, I always love these. Okay. What day? On this seventh day of the seventh month, magpies bridge in a cluster of black and white, the Sky King crosses to meet his queen, 
time tracked by the close-knit wheeling of stars. I watch. You come to me tonight, drunk on wine and cards, nails ridged black with opium to ease the pain of work. We are all men here. Anybody can be a bridge, little raven. Your eyes squeezed shut, but not from pain. We are a trestle, a grade we build together. What matter if you say you'd never choose me, were there women willing in this desert? I chose. I choose the memory we share of rivers, your hair of smoke and raw, wet leather. A man in another man's hand makes himself tool or weapon, says the overseer, as if a man's use to another is only one of work. Pleasure is the only chosen future. You are the home I briefly make, the country I can return to. Here, where the moon wheels its white shoulder in the dark, and you push me to the earth, slip my whiskered tip of hair into your mouth. What day? In his film, Dirty Laundry, a history of heroes, Chinese, oh, sorry, Canadian filmmaker Richard Fung opens with a scene of a train steward reading a ma magazine article with the headline, Canada's Railway, a symbol under threat. A few shots later, this same steward is locked in an embrace with a journalist named Roger Kwong, who's traveling across the Canadian Rockies to research his family's history on the train. The two men's encounter is interspersed with historical footage of the train hurtling through tunnels, the train moving both backwards and forwards in time at once, the men's sex overlaid on the technology Kwong's family helped build. Is the train and its disruption of time where we lose or fully find ourselves? My father recalls traveling back to Seattle from his East Coast college on the transcontinental, during which time he shared a car with his young child, uh, with a young child and her mother. One night, he woke to find the child crying, the mother gone. When he went in search of her, he found the woman in a darkened corridor, skirt hiked, legs wrapped around another passenger. It changed my picture of women forever, my father said, disgusted. I laughed. Move your hands into the dugout dirt. You can feel the nestle of bodies, the soft silt of skin and hair. Translation of a man into labor. Translation of a man into need. And what is that translation? Humiliation or rage or desire? We never stop building the railroad. Okay, moving on to adoption. I think this is it, yes. Close eye. When I was five, a man found me on my corner, asked in German if I was hungry. And when I told him yes, he took my hand and led me to St. Dominic's, where there was bread and milk and sometimes meat. Where there was Daisy, who snapped her fingers in Matron's face and said that she was sick of looking after little boys like me. She said it in American, but I was German then, and she was not my mother, she said, but pushed a sandwich for me anyway through the gate and made me wear a woolen cap that scratched my ears and wrapped a ribbon to the tears in my knees so my legs wore lines of silk. And she held my hand at the depot where they took us and called me little to the others on the train but I could hear the whispers by our door each night and feel the cold, hard knob of coins she nodded in her skirt come morning. Silver, for the color of your mother's eyes, she sang as we crossed the plains, but I do not remember what my mother ever looked like. 
and she taught me a song and she taught me a dance and she taught me to speak a piece of poetry to the farmers at the depot where we were dropped and say, mother in American, if a woman ever looked at us. And I thought someone from the crowd would take us both, but one took her and Dan took me. And here I am with the goats I learned to milk, the heavy pail I do not spill, my mouth full of words said the way they like them so I never get the belt. I have a puppy here and chores all meals. The streets are dirt and when it rains it comes as mud. There are no crowds, no coins, no ribbons at my knees. They were white, I remember, as the stairs I spend my Sundays sweeping. There is a stain. I don't get out, no matter if Dan helps me scrub. You have to shut your eyes to a lot of dirt out here, Dan winks, and touches my head, and sometimes calls me son. Close Eye. Between 1854 and 1929, over 250,000 children were sent by train from New York City orphanages to the West to be adopted. Charles Loring Brace of the Children's Aid Society implemented and administrated the orphan train, as it came to be known, along with the Children's Village and New York Foundling Society. The plan was to decrease the number of abandoned children of those growing up in poverty on the East Coast. According to a 1913 Iowa Anchor newspaper article, Homes are desired in both town and country, but they must be good homes where influences are of the best and under no circumstances will a child be placed with people who wish chore boys or kitchen drudges. Children as young as infants and as old as 17 were accompanied by nurses and sisters of charity to towns across the Midwest and Texas distributed to any family who made application. Unlike contemporary adoption practices, many of the parents neither applied to nor were approved by a state social services agency. Some children were, some children were adopted by passersby or those lured to the station by circular letters. Many children were immigrants or children of immigrants, specifically German, Irish, and Italian. None were African-American for fear they'd be worked as slaves. The orphan train later implemented more regulations, including home visits to ensure families did not abuse their wards. That said, here is one 1890 newspaper account of an open market adoption process in Hebron, Nebraska, that leaves me cold. Quote, the greatest contest was for possession of a sweet-faced, modest girl of 14. There were as many as a dozen wanted her. My own gungung was adopted twice. The first by my great grandfather James, that his wife would have a company after he left for America. The second by my great uncle Howard, who lived in Chicago and legally claimed Gungung as his son. Once Gungung arrived in Chicago, Howard put him to work painting vases for shop, pagodas, and opera singers copied from magazines, misty hillsides, scraps of poems. Gungung painted them on soy sauce bottles that Howard sold as antiques. Most Chinese American families have stories like mine. It wasn't until college I understood many of my uncles and aunts weren't related to me by blood, but paper. Are all families as wide, as arbitrary, as fragile? The orphan train only ended after the emergence of organized foster care. Perhaps you wonder what happened to that girl in Hebron. Perhaps, like me, you are afraid to find out. Irish Americans. So um, this is not all of the uh, poems on this site are videos, some are documentary poems. So I'm going to read for you a few of the letters that I found from Irish Americans um, and Irish Canadians, basically people coming over to work in America and Canada to give a sense of what their experience was like. And interesting, it's, interestingly, it's also a story of cholera. Dear Margaret, it is called Scarlatina. The disorder is all in the throat. The boy, I said, is a son of Henry's that lives with us. And he has another, James lives with his mother. This boy is about eight years and the other between six and seven. Dear Margaret, I cannot find words to express at all times in sickness and death. Dear Margaret, we are sorry about your house being burned. We hope you have got another. Dear John, 
The shoemakers is on strike here and about 500 walking out. The masters want to reduce them 20% of the wages they had and the men won't stand it. There is not enough work here for the blacks, let alone white people. My mind is a hell to me. There is about 100,000 people idle here and every ship brings out hundreds more. If you know anybody that is thinking of coming out, tell them for God's sake, stop where they are. I found Maurice Murphy and he gave me $1 on Tuesday, St. Patrick Day. He has no work either. For God's sake, don't let anybody know the way we are off. Nothing doing, no expectation, nothing to fall back on in the way of trade. Crops failed these two or three year back, not much provisions imported, exports limited to deals, railroad sleepers and grinding stones. Our square timber is all consumed or at least the forest is done. This will give you an idea of our state at present, also of our future prospects. Over the blooming, the downing sun, first on the mink of love and think that I were by and Dear Father Penn, could not write the distress of the Irish passengers which arrived, those sickness and death, of, death and distress of every kind. There are thousands of them buried on the island. Let me know how James Burns and his sister are. Let me know how John Burns is, Biddy Kelly and family. Milk and butter is very dear here. Write as soon as you can. I will be uneasy until I hear from you. As I have a notion to marry again, if I could get a safe match, please send some good young widows or old maids. It's a fact women of all kinds are rather scarce here, but especially good ones. Pick out one for me and tell her I will take her on your recommend and pay her passage into the bargain. I am one year younger than you and have two good horses, four cows, eight sheep, 20 hogs, 80 acres, timbered land, about 30 of it, improved and all tools to work my farm and am a carpenter to boot. Markets rates as follows, potatoes, one shilling, three something pence, stone butter, pound flour for 196 pounds, 35 shilling eggs. Well, Jack, I will stop my scribbling for this time. By the way, how is Tommy getting along? Tell him not to fall in love with some Yankee hooker doodle. Dear cousin, Maggie has not had a letter from you forever, and of course she feels slighted. I tell her that if I was as long without a letter, I should be really crazy. Johnny, you do not write. What is the trouble? Good night with love from your cousin. P.S. You did well to hold on to your horse. Do you remember? How did it get so wild? Edward McCarthy. Dear Ned, you will find it strange of me to ask as I already got one picture, but the eyes are so dull that you can hardly notice them. The man said if I could get the lend of others, he would try to paint one right away. He has a splendid hand. His name is Frost Bookkeeper. I hope you won't refuse the first, this first favor I ask of you for the lend of Jim's picture now to paint. I am trying to have one copied. It will be so nice for the children to look at when we are dead. Dear wife, 15 new cases and nine deaths. Persons attacked frequently do not live more than five or six hours. If the cholera should increase, I think I should go to Portland, though I suppose I should lose my situation. Don't let this alarm you. I will write again tomorrow or next day. Don't be too anxious and give my love to all the dear children. Perhaps I ought not to have written as I have. Bye-bye, Johnny. My health Thank God, it's pretty good. My age is pretty round. I am wrestling with Mr. 60, but I hope I will get at the other side of him. I am gray and I wear spectacles. I am sober and I do not drink. I am well-liked and I offend nobody. And I am happy to hear from you at all times when you are pleased to write. We had strawberries and cream, coconut chocolate and biscuit, lobster salad and coffee. Wrote a letter to John John and sent him 5D. Wrote some poetry said Mary to a frolic some book that was running away. The cross-eyed fellow came in the fox. I'm going to leave tomorrow forever. And if you go to the last, you'll get find out who the writers of these letters were. This comes with a paired poem actually, and I won't read the note for this. I will say what was interesting about um, the story about the Irish is the story, it basically twines the story of the cholera and there are mul multiple cholera outbreaks um, during the 19th century, one during the time that the transcontinental was being built and the Irish were blamed for the cholera. What's also quite interesting is that the Irish were actually the first um, ethnic group to suffer from um, a sort of a, an anti-immigration policy in Massachusetts. It was under a 
I think, anti-indigency law that I think about 50,000 Irish immigrants were sent back to Ireland. But I want to read, this should be it, or play this video that is an accompaniment. Barry. First, it was a pocket watch the archaeologists unearthed. Its plated chain strangled inside this grave's massed roots, black hands clawing at twelve and two. Trains run on time as well as coal, the company owners knew, so that the iron cars could pass each other untouched in the dark. Proximity requires partition. One must invent zones, rules, schedules. One must assign value to what threatens the capital, what counts as a loss. Someone fevers in his rented room. Someone coughs and claps a hand to another's back, and a ghost of ours passes like a shadow straight through you. Only a matter of time. Once the cholera came before they'd point to us, the company men who left our bodies where they were felled, spike handlers, carpenters, Irishmen, all bludgeoned and dumped at Duffy's cut. Beside these tracks, they hired us to build. Barry. In their book, Massacre at Duffy's Cut, Tragedy and Conspiracy in the Pennsylvania Rail Railroad, brothers and authors, doctors Willie Mee Watson and J. Francis Watson argue that the Pennsylvania Railroad lied about the 1832 cholera related deaths of 57 Irish railroad workers just outside Philadelphia, claiming it wasn't cholera, but mass murder sparked by panic over cholera that killed them. While not a story about the transcontinental, cholera is still a story about the railroad. Both the Irish and the railroad were blamed for the spread of cholera, the Irish incorrectly, the railroads correctly, as ease of travel made transmission of the disease rapid among growing populations. Cholera readjusted our ideas of time and space, and just as, oh sorry, space and community, just as the railroad changed our ideas of time. Because of the train, phrases such as time's up, time's a wasting, and the train is leaving the station entered our vocabulary. The transcontinental led to the division of the nation into four standard time zones to prevent crashes. Like cholera, trains made us uncomfortably aware of our intimacy with other bodies and value systems, which may be why John Palfrey of the Brattle Square Church in Boston delivered this strident 1832 sermon on cholera, declaring it was through this disease that the world would, quote, straighten itself out. Such moralizing continues. In 2020, certain environmentalists lauded the COVID-19 pandemic for its influence on climate change, though by the end of February 2021, over 2.5 million people had died. Intimacy does not require or necessarily produce empathy. In 1909, a man working for the Pennsylvania Rat Railroad named Julian F. Sachse interviewed a man who swore he'd seen the ghosts of the 57 Irish workers dancing over their mass grave. Saxe suggests what the man saw wasn't ghosts at all, but ignis fatus, caused by so many of the cholera victims being buried together without a sufficient covering of earth. The man refused to believe it. I saw what I saw, he insists. Saxe's transcript is full of the man's tics and drunken repetitions. It's designed to make him look foolish. We're not supposed to trust this history. Or maybe that isn't the point. Everyone is afraid of ghosts. My father, too, during the pandemic, repeated himself, afraid of death, afraid of my death. I would call every few days to see if he was healthy. He sounded so small. Our cities were in the vice grip of the pandemic, and now time had expanded to the size of a continent. For two years, all I could hold of him was his voice. Don't come back home, he'd beg me. Relational time asks if the thing speeding toward us is our past or our future. The railroad workers were murdered in 1832, in August 2004, they were disinterred. So many died. So many have died. I saw what I saw. All right, let's go back to the thing and see what other people would like to hear about. Um, death, okay. Okay, yes. Hobos. Hobos and death rituals, manifest destiny, prostitution, definitely hobos. Okay. 
hobos. Let me read that first and then death rituals, um, Native Americans and manifest destiny. And that, that'll probably take me to the end of this whole thing. Um, not the whole project, unfortunately, but um, hobos, is this it? Yes. This is again, a poem that was a sort of a documentary poem. I did some interviews with people who ride the rails illegally and um, the first wave of hobos, they used to call themselves hobos, was during the, um, the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. And a lot of people were taking the train west to try and find work. But what's interesting now is a lot of people are not using the train in that kind of way. And I'll talk about that in the note. But this is based on a kind of story that somebody, um, a couple of people sort of told me, it's just an assemblage. Uh, one thing to say about this poem is it's actually kind of hard to read out loud and you'll hear why. Dead is what they call a torn up track whose living rails that jumped to bed down in the wells and filled the thud hit every trestle steam at dawn like horses at the track I trained before the Phillies foundered sick they fired the agents vets they fired the riders me I love how in a well you thumb with sound until your bare lips start to bleed like canisters of oil I stole inside the train you'll find a nation what it wants to eat and wear and what it likes to buy a ring a phone some jeans of course there is no reason why to jump a train except to lose the edges of yourself the time like pacing moxie at the track that speed that almost tears your hands off at the wrist she was the last to go her tendon bowed and worthless and insurance no one rides a race who's just for pleasure no one hops a train if they can take a plane a car whose engine speed is gauged by horses kept alive in memory for sentiment i guess there's ghosts of what we were and are we cannot bear to leave out in the desert where i'm going home just not right now i said of moxie not right now before the race she hasn't many left in her you know she trusts you right the owner said that slipped me two grand and the shots so we can get to the note on this one um dead if the transcontinental was meant finally to draw America closer to China, it failed. The transcontinental facilitated trade between the coasts and helped shape a national cultural life, but it did not increase American trade to China. Likewise, if the transcontinental was meant to lower travel costs for passengers, that also failed. The cost of a sleeper car from Chicago to Sacramento now runs you close to $6,000. Trains traveling to Sacramento are largely empty of passengers, loaded instead with cars, appliances, crates of olive oil, military vehicles, nuclear waste. The train, imagined as an international event, turned us insular. Perhaps the most significant and accidental benefit was for hobos migrating during the Great Depression. Riders, as they are now called, are rare because of the cheapness of Greyhound and the ubiquity of the car. Riders jump container cars when trains stop for offloading. They hide in the containers front and rear in spaces that can fit two at a time to sleep, though the open air exposure means riders have to wear bandanas to keep their chapped lips from bleeding. Riders track safe jumping times with the aid of a Xerox crew change guide, which according to the riders must never be shared. When I asked one rider why he did it, he said he didn't know. Most people who jump trains are young, white, middle class. They take aliases on the rails and tend to avoid each other. One rider I spoke to said riders are attracted to the anonymity and the lawlessness. To ride the rails, he said, you need to like being invisible. After a few hours in the rocking open hour, air, you start hearing screams and voices. The sound moves through your body. The world become a soundtrack you can't turn off. It's as close as he's ever come to an extended hallucination. Maybe that's why the riders you meet are mostly ex-military, he says. The exposure, the noise, the motion, it sends you out of body out of time. One guy from Afghanistan said it was the only thing that could relax him now. He said it was the closest thing to being in a war. Um, Chinese death rituals. Uh, I won't read the note for this one because we're going to run out of time otherwise, but I'll just sort of say one thing about it. The Chinese death rituals, I'll, I'll have to tell you this before I play this, these two videos. Um, the Chinese did not generally speaking, think they were going to stay in America. So they would pay a Huiguan, who's a district association uh, member, to go and if they died here in America, to bury the body and then disinter the body six months after. Uh, and then basically scrape all the flesh off the bones, break up the bones and put them in boxes or, or jars and send them back to um, China, to the Tunghua Hospital, which is in Hong Kong. What's interesting is that the assumption was that the family members would come and get those 
remains and then bury them back home. But in fact, a lot of people never did that. Um, they left those bodies basically in their jars and their urns. And if you go to the Tunghua Mortuary Hospital now in Hong Kong, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of these jars and boxes still stacked up there waiting to be returned. But this practice was pretty well known about, so well known that very small newspapers across the West would, would complain about the cleanliness of Chinese, saying these are people who basically, they don't even really bury their dead. They dig them up and God knows what they do with them. And they even mentioned that they'd seen some of these corpses you know, put in boxes and shipped out of there. So um, the poem I'm gonna uh, play now actually references that. body. A carload passed last night, their bones returned in barrels marked pickles. Thick as bees, ants, locusts, celestials lay siege to nature in her strongest citadel. Their genius is imitation. Show them once to do a thing and their education is complete. Wherever you put them, you'll find them good. They can withstand freezing, hunger, thirst, and heat. Their simple, narrow, but not dull minds running in old grooves. Congealed quantities, crystals of social substance. Unicated as boys or sodomites, they breed defunct in the heat of germs. They can be shipped to shore in great quantities. Even their clothes come identical, studded with rivets. And there's a companion poem, which is Return. And the opening line, if falling leaves returns to roots, that is a Cantonese saying that refers to um, the idea that that once you're dead, you should return home, you should be buried at home. Uh, one thing I'll say about this poem is that all of the footage that's live, we got with drones. Um, and this is in fact, the landscape of the transcontinental and also some of the ghost towns along the dead transcontinental line. Return. If fallen leaves return to roots, what grows when leaves cannot be gathered? What returns if not the body? What remains, if not the soul? Who is to say these graves empty of their bones mean only loss, not that these men escape death's hold entirely? They are not home, but they are not here either, or have become so full of here, we need another word than gone. So throw out the cormorant, its leg tied with silken ropes. Let it drag the air from memory over and over, as many times as you want. You can't snare what isn't missing. This country claimed their bodies. It never trapped their souls. And I'm gonna pretty much stop here and play the end and the translation. And what I will say, I'll read the last note, which is important for the translation. Over the course of this poem, I have taken the literal meanings Dr. Fu Sheng Wu has translated for me to produce what is a most likely, if not always accurate outcome. There are, of course, other possibilities. Scholars may disagree with my translation. I do not know Chinese. And since so few people in my family now speak it, I will also never learn. My family has lost over time one of our surest connections to the past. Does this matter? And does it matter I haven't shared the other poem here, the second half of that pair carved into the walls of Angel Island? I haven't told you what characters compose that poem. And though I know it's been translated as its own work, I don't know whether the Chinese would also allow me to read across both poems lines, stitching them together so that the sense of one bleeds into the other. I grieve and through my grief touch upon the memory of others. Perhaps the poems are only complete when read this way. Perhaps each text should stand alone. I suspect both. Regardless, the subject of both poems is the same. The loss, the ambition, the death now and forever. Perhaps having read only one poem, you long for the other. Start over. Grief is but one moment of time. The elegy 
goes on forever. When can I count all the dead? This is the sound of a train. Δεν είμαστε επιβάτε στο τρένο εμεί. Στέκει για του κόητε κρού. Σωρέι, βατά στα κοινό. Αυτό είναι ο ήχο ενό τρένου. stop there and take um, any questions that people have. So it looks like there's one question, the Q&A from Asa Daniels. What was the biggest challenge and your favorite thing about learning about your family history? Okay. And there's another question in there. How would you advise someone? What was your own process on how to write about a community? It seems overwhelmingly broad and hard to find a specific focus. Yeah. So I'll take both these questions. They're great ones. So the first one is the biggest challenge and your favorite thing about learning about your family history. The biggest challenge is something not unlike the problems of writing about the transcontinent itself, which is um, my family, perhaps like many families, didn't keep records. Um, and in my family, probably like many families, part of that had to do with legal <laughs> desires. Um, the Chinese Exclusion Act absolutely affected my family structure in the sense that a lot of people came over um, in, in various, maybe not so legal ways. And um, we are essentially people who have five or six different names, um, all, <laughs> depending on the generation. And there was a good reason to keep certain types of stories under wraps uh, for legal reasons. But also, I think there was a real sense uh, in my family that assimilation was the way to go. And so there was a real suppression of anything that sounded negative or bad. Um, anything that sounded painful, you know, the idea was that they wanted their children to become fluent in English and then, in fact, they didn't want them to learn Chinese, they wanted them to be Americans as fast as possible. But that meant that, you know, some of the, the most poignant memories, some of the most personal memories were almost deliberately erased. Um, certainly by my grandparents. I certainly remember um, a very touching moment actually when my grandmother Popo was 93 and she was she had dementia towards the end of her life. And um, suddenly those memories were coming back, but they were incoherent. And they, you know, after years of suppressing their me these memories, they would sort of come back in, in these ways that I couldn't make narrative sense of. And it was painful to see her wanting to share finally, and then being unable to do it. So that was for me the biggest challenge, which is trying to reconstruct um, a sense of what their past must have been based on scraps and fragments. And, and like I said, it was very much like working with the transcontinental material itself. Um, Kyla was asking about how would you, you know, advise someone going about writing about a community? You know, I was not just writing about one community, I was writing about many communities. <laughs> um, and, and the reality is, of course, there's no one story that tells all of their experiences. And so, I went in knowing that there was a sort of inbuilt failure to the process that in selecting certain kinds of stories, I was excluding others. And that's why I say in the very first lyric essay, you know, what is a translation, but a carefully cultivated loss. Um, I see this poem too, as a carefully cultivated loss. Um, we're getting kinds of patterns. I would say with the Irish Americans, um, it was very notable to me how much their letters reflected regret and bitterness and anger, <laughs> um, how morbid they were in general. And I think part of it was because a lot of them, you know, had 
you know, experienced some terrible treatment. Um, in that, that, that was a very common story. Most people experienced some fairly terrible treatment, but of course, a lot of the Irish passengers coming over um, experienced death very close up, you know, with cholera. Um, and the sense of regret of coming to this nation, hoping that they were escaping genocide and war and um, famine and discovering that in fact, this was not a, a country that was <laughs> giving them much more opportunities than the, the, the place that they had left. So I did able, I was able to sort of say, well, okay, knowing that that seems to be a general sentiment, can I select from letters from there? Um, great, uh, 38 people there. <laughs> Could you talk a bit about putting the videos together, the editing, timing, sound design, et cetera, video essays, video poetry? That's a great question. It's funny how few people ask that question. So I'm grateful that you asked that. So when I first um, designed this project, I knew when I got the commission, I wanted to create a multimedia experience. And I knew um, that because there are so many interesting visual records and there can be a really nice play between text and, and, and image there. When you go to the video, so I made I made a series of videos that would scroll in the background while I read, and a friend of mine who is um, a documentary filmmaker uh, saw this and she was like, you know, these are okay, but you could really pump this up. And um, so I started working with her, and her name is Jenny Lynn Merton, and you know she works with this. She her her company is called Perpendicular Productions. So we went back and forth. You know, I would I I gave her my videos, and she was like, "What about this?" And she was the one who was able to convince me to use um, sound. I had used uh, music, but I was afraid that the music would counteract what was going on with the uh, poems and stuff like that. And so she changed out some of the music. We went back and forth on musical choices, but she convinced me that sometimes, you know, videos allow us to take in different kinds of information. So there's um, poems that I have about the Civil War and soldiers and things like that, who had worked on the um, Union Pacific side of the railroad. And you can hear gunfire. And then you also hear the sound of rails being hammered in and, and the echo of those two things really sort of makes that link between the transcontinental as a Marshall project, as well as a technological project too. Um, you know, she also wanted to get footage of the places that I was writing about. And so we, you know, hired a guy who also, um, he works a lot for Hollywood. He's a climber and he does a lot of um, you know, like he worked on Point Break, the, you know, <laughs> vision of it. And he got his drones up there and he was like, let's take, a, you know, like, let's get the visuals of the railroad and let's get visuals of that landscape. And so they were able to do stuff that I just had not even thought about doing. And so it was, these are combined efforts. Like, you know, my first attempts were very much very limited attempts and thank you know thankfully being able to work with them that we were able to really bump those up and change things out um but that said with video poetry it's different than using text and image in a book text and image in a book you can think about triangulations of meaning images that do not accompany the text and create a sort of third meaning but with video poems you have to think about something a little bit more illustrative something that really gives a kind of narrativity because when we listen to poems sometimes we can't really process all the information going on so the visuals really like you know put that narrative into focus how did it take a match to the hobo rap uh, you know it took me a while i knew exactly how it was supposed to sound so the line breaks are very deliberate um, and the lack of punctuation is very deliberate so that if a careful reader wanted to sort of use those as sort of almost musical notation, they would probably end up with something that sounds a bit like my hobo rap. But, um, but I wanted to make that really, really excruciatingly clear. Um, and there you go. And point break. Yes, there's always point break. Um, I've got three more minutes if there's any other kinds of questions that you have. Oh, there's another question in the Q&A. Nope, that was it. Um, but I'm super happy to talk about anything else if there's any, or, and happy to stop here too. <laughs> it's like really quiet. This is your last chance. I'm going away forever. <laughs> but uh, I will write again in case people want to take a look at the website. Um, there's, the island in the second poem. The island in the second poem. Oh, so what day you are the kind? Um, 
I'm not sure I understand the question. The island in the second part. Angel Island, I believe it was. Oh, Angel Island. Yes, Angel Island. So that's the immigration station. It's like the Ellis Island of the West. Um, it's where the Chinese were detained during the Chinese Exclusion Act, and it lasted for a really long time. But it was, um, that's, that's what I was referring to. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it looks like everyone's exhausted. <laughs> well, is there another thing in the Q and A? Oh, just a thank you. Thank you for sharing this. Yeah, thank you for all, all for coming and thank you for having me. It was it was a lot of fun, at least for me. So, <laughs> thank you very much. We we loved it. It was a lot of fun for us. Great as well. And there yeah, were two hundred and fifty so. of us joining you. So. Yeah, okay, great. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good weekend. Take Thanks. care. Thanks. Thank you, Paisley. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Paisley. Bye. Bye. Bye.